let me mention some course administration things before we get into the heart of the content. First of all, your midterm exam is coming up this week, and I'm going to have that available online for you from 8 a.m. Thursday morning until 10 p.m. Thursday. I mean, I'm sorry, 8 a.m. Thursday morning until 10 p.m. Sunday night. Uh, and you need to take it sometime during that period. Uh, there, you're going to have to have a a really, really unusual circumstance to get any kind of extension. And this is a lot of points relative to your final grade, so do take that. It's going to cover all the material in weeks one through four. And I will post a review sheet by Tuesday, and that will be a pretty detailed look at what you need to study to do well on this exam. Secondly, writing assignment one. Uh, don't think of your grade in terms of the percentage that it recommends because I want you to remember the grading scheme. There were four categories and the maximum you could get was five points in each category. And to get a five in any category you had to really nail it and get it almost perfect. So a four in every category was a very good paper. So if you got 16 out of 20 uh, even though when you start figuring the percentage that's only 80 percent that was really a very good grade so don't worry about your grade on the paper um, but this did give me a great opportunity to see how you understand the formation of the Bible and to give you some feedback I felt like I really got a good opportunity to see where you might have a gap in your understanding and where I could offer a little bit of correction and I think that's going to serve you well on the exam um, and ultimately on the final exam, and just knowing and applying this material in your study of the Bible. Please do look at my feedback and take it seriously, and email me or send me a message on Moodle Rooms if you have any questions. Uh, some general notes, and these will help you on your next two writing assignments. First of all, don't write a flowery introduction. Just be short and sweet and to the point with the introduction. Uh, you don't have to, if for these writing assignments, you don't have to set it up. Uh, you don't have to ask a bunch of questions or lay any philosophical groundwork because that just takes up a whole lot of the words uh, that you're allowed in your assignments and it doesn't contribute anything to the goals of the assignment. So just get right into the material next time. Uh, one point that it seemed like a good number of you had a little bit of confusion on was the three tests um, for a New Testament book uh, when the early church was looking to determine what books were really inspired scripture and what should be in the canon. They looked at whether a book had apostolic authority, whether it conformed to the doctrine handed down from the apostles, uh, and whether it was widely used in the churches. Those were not tests of all books, Old and New Testament, those were specifically tests of New Testament books. The Old Testament canon was set by the time of Jesus, and what books were regarded as Scripture was really set. There was some, um, some discussion afterwards about the order of the books, but in terms of what books were regarded as God-breathed, inspired Old Testament Scripture, it was already set. Those three tests are for New Testament Scripture. So do keep that in mind. Um, also, a point that a lot of you didn't seem to mention, and I, and I suspect maybe a point that you didn't really grasp, is that as scribes copied the manuscripts of the Bible over the years, scribal errors crept in. Many of you pointed out that the scribes did an accurate job of relaying the manuscripts down through the years, and that's true. That's absolutely true, and that's why we have such a, an, a, uh, an accurate Bible. But it is important to note when we're talking about the transmission of the Bible that as scribes copied manuscripts for so many hundreds of years, there were times where they made a little error, and that's why in little places we have various manuscripts of the same passage that say different things. And part of the process of compiling our English Bible is for scholars to look at the different manuscripts and try to decide which one was the original reading. So the differences in manuscripts and the little scribal errors in copying the Bible don't affect any major doctrine of Christianity. There are no reason for us to lose confidence in the Bible in any way. But I do want you to realize that the transmission of the Bible by scribes 
did not always involve 100% accuracy in copying the text. Uh, and that is a fact that we have to deal with and that we talked about some uh, thus far in the class. And then finally, a point that I thought a lot of you uh, didn't explain clearly was that the main factor in the, the different English translations we have is translation philosophy. Uh, we do have some different versions of the Bible because of different manuscripts used, but that's really not the biggest factor. The biggest reason why we have so many English translations is that some use a dynamic equivalence translation philosophy where it's thought for thought, and some use a formal equivalence philosophy where it's word for word. And there's a whole spectrum. It's not just one or the other. There's a whole, a whole range between those two options that different translations of the Bible use. And so do keep that in mind. Now, to this week's material, uh, let's talk about the three genres of biblical literature that the Stein reading discussed this week. First of all, Proverbs. Uh, Stein very helpfully points out in this chapter that Proverbs are pithy sayings that express general truths, and they do have exceptions, um, but they're still general rules. So, for instance, the biggest example he gives is train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. We all know that that's true, first of all, because the way you train a child in godliness and in character does set a course for life. But we probably also all know people who raised their children in a very godly fashion, but the children ended up being far from God when they grew up. And what does that mean? Does that mean that the parents must not have done a good job? No, it doesn't mean that. It just shows that there are exceptions to the rules. Uh, I thought that the examples Stein gives in the 2011 edition on pages 132 and 133 are very instructive and very helpful about Proverbs. And I, I thought it was worth talking about them even on the lecture video, even though I know you can read them by yourself. Uh, this is the bottom of page 132. In the, if you're using the 1994 edition, this is the chapter on Proverbs. But whoever listens to me, and speaking of wisdom, will dwell secure and will not be at ease without dread of disaster. That's Proverbs 1.33. And Stein says, Do not some believers experience suffering and even martyrdom because of their faithfulness to the Lord? And he's right. Um, but at the same time, we recognize that life is generally better for those who listen to wisdom and who follow the Lord. And then you have this one. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. That, too, is a general principle that is true. If you honor the Lord with your money, if you give your offerings to Him sacrificially then and use your money wisely, then He takes care of it and your needs are met. At the same time, as Stein points out, we all know that there are some people who are faithful, but at the same time end up in poverty. It's an exception to the rule, but it doesn't cancel out the rule as a general principle. And that's the point of Proverbs. Proverbs are general sayings that communicate a general truth. There are exceptions to these general truths, but they're still general truths. If you realize this, this will help you tremendously in your study of Proverbs, not just in the book of Proverbs, but Proverbs elsewhere in Scripture. Because it could really be a conundrum for a person if they read something in the book of Proverbs, but then can think of an exception. That could really undermine confidence in Scripture. But when you realize that Proverbs have exceptions by definition, then that really helps. But knowing that, I don't want us to veer off the other side of the road, where we focus on the exceptions and forget that Proverbs are divinely inspired general rules that are true most of the time. Um, I think we can focus so much on the fact that sometimes there are believers who are faithful with their money and are in great need that we lose sight of the fact that God richly takes care of His people when they're faithful to Him. And we can uh, focus on the exceptions of people who are faithful to God and who have extreme hardship in life and forget the general rule that God gives joy and He shepherds through life in a way that they 
would not want to change those who follow him. Proverbs is a wonderful book to express general rules, and there's a, a whole lot of Bible study that we could do in Proverbs to show how marvelous and how uh, overwhelmingly applicable these general truths are. So just keep those things in mind about Proverbs. Don't veer off the road either side in saying that there are no exceptions to what Proverbs say, but then on the other hand, don't veer off the other side of the road and, uh, and focus on the exceptions so much that you forget the general truth that's being communicated. Well, that's probably enough on Proverbs. Uh, thinking about prophecy for a few minutes, it's very important to remember that prophecy is not just telling the future, but it's any telling of a message from God. A good short way to put it that Stein says, and you may have heard elsewhere, is prophecy is not just foretelling, it's forthtelling. And then Stein gives some uh, rules for interpreting prophecy that really like what we talked about in Proverbs, have the capacity to really change the way you read the Bible for the better. He points out, number one, that judgment prophecies are conditional. You could think a prophecy was unreliable if you go, say, to the book of Jonah, and Jonah announces to the Ninevites, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, of course, the Ninevites repented and Nineveh was not destroyed then, although the book of Nahum records that later on Nineveh was, in fact, destroyed because the repentance... Uh, was not lasting, and it was not uh, n well, not not lasting repentance. Uh, but at any rate, the principle in Jonah is that when God announces a judgment against a people, it's conditional. If the people will repent, then God will relent of the judgment. Stein points out that in Jeremiah, God actually sets out this rule. And as you're reading the prophetic books, you'll see this over and over, saying such and such a nation will be destroyed, or such and such a people will get this. But if they repent, then they'll not receive that judgment. Now, the if they repent is not stated oftentimes, but it's understood within the genre of prophecy. That's rule number one. Uh, rule number two and this can really help you as well. Cosmic terminology often describes temporal judgments or God entering history. And when I say cosmic terminology, I'm talking about uh, where the prophets say things like the sun will be darkened and the stars will be darkened and the moon will cease to shine. Uh, it sounds like when you read that, that it's talking about the end of the world. But if you start reading prophetic literature, not just in the Bible, but more widely, prophetic literature of that time, you see that prophets used language like that to talk about temporal judgments, times when God did something in history, and they didn't literally mean that the stars would be darkened or the sun would be darkened. Now, don't get me wrong, if God wanted to darken the sun and if God wanted to darken the stars and make the moon stop shining, he very well could. He has no lack of power to do that. But what Stein is saying, rightly, is just that there was a convention that prophets use certain language, not literalistically, but figuratively, to talk about certain judgments from God. So, you go to Isaiah chapter 13, for instance. This is one that Stein references. Isaiah chapter 13 and verses 9 through 11. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. And then watch this part. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Now, it sounds like, when you read that cosmic language, that God's talking about the end of the world. But you go to verse 1, and it says, The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. And the first application of that is that Isaiah is announcing that the nation, the kingdom of Babylon, is going to come to an end. And it did. God intervened in history and judged that nation. The stars still were shining during that judgment. But what Isaiah was saying is God is going to break into history and do something. You go down to verse 19, and you see also it's about Babylon. It's not, it's not about primarily the end of the world. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. 
Now, I do think there's a part of this prophecy that sets out a pattern of God's work that will ultimately be fulfilled at the return of Jesus and the judgment of the whole world. But the primary meaning of this passage is a temporal judgment. You get the same thing in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when Peter stands up to preach and he quotes the prophet Joel and he references some of this cosmic imagery. So listen to this. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. He's telling them, This prophecy I'm about to quote is being fulfilled today. And here's what Joel said. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And then here's the cosmic language. Then I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Peter's saying this is fulfilled today. Well, on the day of Pentecost, God certainly did break into history and send his Holy Spirit in a fresh way on the church and start the church as, as we know it today. But the sun didn't literally become dark and the moon didn't literally turn to blood. So, and interestingly, this is kind of a side note, but the sun darkening, it was long part of prophetic language, just language that prophets use to describe when God broke into history and did something, whether it be a judgment or some other great act. And think about what the gospel writers tell us when Jesus died. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened with the sun? Well, it became dark. That When you start to understand that the prophets use the image of the sun being darkened to show God breaking into history and doing something amazing, that passage about the cross becomes that much cooler when you think about it. God literally darkened the sun when Jesus died on the cross. And that was to show that he was breaking into history, just as the prophets talked about, and doing something major to change history. At that point, it wasn't just figurative language, but when Jesus died on the cross, the sun was actually darkened to show that God was judging the sin of the world at that moment in Jesus. So I, I think that's just a neat tidbit. When you start to understand that the prophets talking about the sun being darkened was a language that reflected judgment, you see why that the gospel writers tell us that happened when Jesus died on the cross. But... Uh, this whole discussion of cosmic language sometime being figurative should make us think twice, especially about interpreting prophecy literalistically. Now, we want to take everything literally, meaning, uh, well, that's probably not the best way to say it. For every passage, we want to understand what the original author intended to communicate. Now, sometimes, like with historical narrative, the original author intended for us to take his words literally. But sometimes, in prophecies, the original author did not intend for us to take his words literally or literalistically. He intended for the readers to understand what he meant by certain poetic imagery. So this is especially important for reading the book of Revelation. This is not a course on the book of Revelation, but... I do want you to remember when you read the book of Revelation that this is a book that is a book of prophecy. So when you read in Revelation about the sun being darkened and the moon being turned to blood and certain things like that, consider that John may not have been telling us something literal at that moment, but he may be using this same prophetic imagery that Isaiah uses and Joel uses to talk to us about God breaking into history. Uh, it's just something to think about. And I, I do think there are a lot of prophecy gurus that take Revelation so literalistically that they miss the message that John was trying to communicate to his readers because in prophecy, not all the language is literal. And in particular, some of this language about uh, 
cosmic things. And then finally, a third principle about prophecy is that there are times when prophecy has a more full fulfillment than what the prophet expected. And Stein explains that the fuller meaning is often an implication of the author's willed meaning, and he wants to guard against uh, our saying of any prophetic passage that God meant something that the prophet didn't understand at all. Uh, and so Stein says, even though the prophet might not have consciously understood uh, the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy, that it was within his intended pattern of meaning. And if on this side of the cross you went back to Isaiah and you said, when you talked about the virgin being with child, is, is Jesus being born of a virgin within the pattern of what you meant? Uh, Stein, I think, would want us would think that Isaiah would say, yeah, that is within the pattern of what I meant, even though I didn't know exactly what was going on at the time. Um, I just wanted to make a little comment to you, because I'm not sure the way Stein explains this is the very most helpful thing in the world. Because I think sometimes God's work in the Old Testament set a pattern of how he would work in Jesus. But I don't think the authors of the Old Testament always necessarily had any knowledge that what they were writing was establishing a pattern that Jesus would fulfill. Um, f for instance, I referenced that, that passage where Isaiah predicts that there will be a, a child born of a virgin. Uh, it's Isaiah 7.14. Let me read it to you, and then let me read the New Testament fulfillment. Uh, I'll start at Isaiah 7.10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz, who was a king of Israel, said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then he goes on, to say in verse 17, The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So, in Isaiah, Isaiah was telling the Israelites there's going to be a virgin who has a son and calls him Emmanuel, and this is a sign of God's work in your time. But then you go forward to Matthew chapter 1, where it's talking about the birth of Jesus. And Matthew says in chapter 1, uh, verse 22, about Jesus' birth, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and, shall, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Matthew says this prophecy was about Jesus. But when Isaiah gave the prophecy, the immediate referent of the prophecy was not Jesus. And I think the way we should think of this in passages like it are that in the Old Testament, God was setting down a pattern of the way he would work. And in the New Testament, Jesus operated according to the same pattern. But at the time that those things were happening in the Old Testament, the people that were writing about them did not necessarily know that what they were writing was establishing a pattern that Jesus would also follow. Uh, another example of this is Hosea 11.1 and then Matthew 2.15. Um, if you're flipping in your Bible with me, keep your finger in Matthew there, but then let's go back to Hosea. Uh, here's Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So Hosea is talking about the nation of Israel, and he says God called his son Israel out of out of Egypt. Then you go to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15. I'll back up to verse 13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. This is talking about baby Jesus and Joseph. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And he quotes Hosea, Out of Egypt I called my son. So Matthew says when Joseph took the baby Jesus to Egypt to flee 
the wicked King Herod. He was fulfilling the prophecy of Hosea when Hosea said, Out of Egypt I called my son. But when Hosea wrote that, his immediate subject was not Jesus. It was not the Messiah. It was the nation of Israel. Hosea was talking about God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt, and he described Israel as God's son. And so Hosea said, Out of Egypt I called my son. I think this is explained in the same way, that the prophet was establishing a pattern of the way that God worked. He brought his son, his beloved, out of Egypt. And then when Jesus came along, God worked in Jesus' life in the same way that he had worked in Israel's life earlier. It was a pattern. Now the prophet, when he wrote, whether it's Hosea or Isaiah, didn't necessarily know that God would work according to that same pattern in the life of Jesus. He was just describing God's work in his time. And I don't necessarily think that we need to get hung up on whether the original author had this in mind as an implication. Uh, well, by definition, he doesn't have it in mind. But I don't think we need to worry about whether the original author would say to us, yes, that's part of what I meant. I think God can use the grammar and the context of a passage to obviously communicate a meaning that was not in the pattern of meaning communicated by the original author. But it is obviously a true meaning of the passage from what the New Testament tells us and even just from the grammar and the context of the Old Testament passage as we can look at it now on this side of the cross. Um, now, Stein is helpful in that he wants to control against making wild interpretations of the Old Testament that have no merit and no basis in the grammar and the context. He's certainly right about that. We don't need to make wild interpretations of the Old Testament. But I do think it's important for us to say, however you want to explain it, that many times the Old Testament authors established a pattern of God's work that ultimately was the pattern that God used in the life of Jesus. But those Old Testament authors did not know that their pattern would ultimately be fulfilled in the life of Jesus. I feel like I'm not explaining this with complete clarity, so if you still have questions, uh, do ask me by email or, um, or by messaging through Moodle Rooms. But I wanted to address this, and we are going to talk about uh, how the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus later at greater length when we read the Graham Goldsworthy book. So we'll just kind of press pause on this discussion for now. Finally, there's a chapter on idioms. Um, idioms are phrases whose meaning is different than the normal meaning of the individual words in the phrase. So, for instance, English idioms are pay through the nose. Uh, we say that and we mean pay an exorbitant price, but we do not literally mean we're paying through our nose. We say it's raining cats and dogs. We talk about someone kicking the bucket. We talk about breaking the ice. All these phrases have meanings that are different than the meanings of the word in the phrase. And in the Bible, it's extremely important to recognize when there is an idiom being used. Otherwise, you'll get the wrong idea. <laughs> Imagine, for instance, if someone... 2,000 years from now is reading a book by an author that is alive today, and that author says, so-and-so kicked the bucket. Well, if in 2,000 years nobody uses the phrase, kicked the bucket, and they don't know what that means, the person would be very confused unless they knew that was an idiom. It's the same way with us reading the Bible. And a good example that Stein uses is the biblical use of the term hate. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says, that if you want to come after him, you have to hate your father and your mother. That can be confusing, because Jesus has told us to love even our enemies. Now, why is he telling us here to hate? Well, and that's confusing until you realize that it's an idiom. Hate is an expression that the biblical authors often use to mean love less. So, in Genesis chapter 29, Moses talks about Jacob loving Rachel and hating Leah. He obviously didn't hate Leah because he had many children with her, and she was, uh, she was his wife. But what, he, what the author meant is simply that Jacob loved Leah less than he loved Rachel. There are other idioms like that where when we understand that they are idioms, then we can interpret the Bible a lot better. 
one question is, well, how do you recognize when a Bible passage is using an idiom? A red flag should go up if you read a passage and you think, that just doesn't make any sense at all if I take the words literally. That that can make you realize that may be an idiom. And one good way to, to then learn whether it is an idiom is to go to a good biblical commentary. And the commentator should be able to tell you whether something is an expression and what the expression meant. Uh, there's one other thing that we ought to say when it comes to idioms. I think back to when we discussed the two different translation philosophies, formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence. And in the writing assignment number one, some of you said formal equivalence, a word-for-word -word translation, is more accurate than dynamic equivalence, a thought-for-thought. -thought. Well, when you come to idioms, that's a place where you can see that that's not true. They're just different. One formal equivalence is not better or more accurate necessarily because you come to the passage where, well, we can go to Rachel and Leah. When, it, when Moses said that Jacob hated Leah and loved Rachel, well, a formal equivalent word-for-word -word translation is going to keep that very wording, love and hate. But a dynamic equivalent, trying to translate the thought rather than the word, might say... Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. That's not word for word, but for the English reader, that may be more accurate because it gets at what the original author intended to convey. So idioms are just one small example of how we should not say that word for word is necessarily more accurate than thought for thought. Each has advantages and disadvantages. Well, there's much more that we can say about all these things, but I'm going to leave it there for right now. Uh, I hope you all do well on the exam this week, and I will get you a review sheet soon to help you in your preparation.